Okay. Um, so, hi. Uh, my name is um, I, I'm Emily Wilder, and um, I'm the program manager for Grassroots Wildlife Conservation Program at Zoo New England here in Boston. So, um, our program, we're focused on addressing local wildlife conservation issues through population monitoring and management, and we have a really strong citizen uh, engagement component. So we wanted to share some of the lessons that we've learned from over 10 years of working with schools, um, because we've often been asked questions about this from other organizations that are contemplating similar collaborations. So in this presentation, I'm going to focus on our turtle head starting program. But I will note that we do also work with and have similar programs with other taxa as well. Um, okay, so our turtle head starting program is called Hatch. Um, we've been head starting turtles since 2007 and we began working with schools in 2009. To date, we've head started and released over a thousand turtles, mostly Blanding's turtles but also wood turtles, uh, Easter box turtles, um, in a few instances, snapping turtles, um, and also hopefully soon some spotted turtles. So um, the first two years, we raised a small number of turtles at the zoo, as well as at the homes of some staff and volunteers, but it really be quickly became apparent to us that we needed more capacity to raise hatchlings. And Dr. Brian Windmiller, who founded this project, thought to emulate the Massachusetts Northern Red-Bellied Cooter Head Starting Program, which had school involvement. So currently we work with um, so 1,000 turtles and we work with more than 40 schools and we engage 3,000 students annually. So why work with schools, right? Right now, some of you may have some of the same skeptical faces as some of these third graders. Um, head starting is a pretty common conservation intervention strategy used with turtles around the world, but there are very few programs that are run through schools, right, uh, at least that we know of, but there are some real benefits to working with schools. Um, first of all, I think the, the biggest benefit of working with schools is that you can build a constituency of people, um, especially kids who care about turtle conservation, right? As the saying goes, right, you won't save what you don't love and you won't love what you don't know. Um, and we really believe that the best hope for wildlife is having as many people as possible know about and love wildlife, especially the wildlife that live around them. So this is really um, also an opportunity to reach a wider audience beyond the normal constituents that maybe walk through your door or read your website. And on top of that, with a classroom raising turtles, right, you're engaging with them for an entire year. And that's going to have a much greater effect than a one-time public lecture or volunteer event. Um, working with schools is also an opportunity to distribute the labor, right? Caring for turtles is a lot of work, as those of you who do that know. And by working with schools, you expand your capacity. And finally, uh, we found that working with schools is a uh, source of income or revenue for conservation. So at a very minimum, you're sharing those husbandry costs. But we've also found that many schools have funds set aside for external programming. And Turtle Head Starting is a really good opportunity for hands-on STEM learning, and schools are very, very interested. Um, we've been able to defray some of our field costs, such as radio tracking and nest surveying, through income from school programming. And also, we also apply for grants that help us provide free programming to schools that are in underserved communities that might not have the funds for those external programming, so we can make sure to reach a wide audience of students. Um, so if it's so great, right, why don't more organizations work with schools? Um, I think the first issue that we've seen cited most often is regulations and permitting. Um, for, for good reason, right? There are often strict laws on who can handle rare and endangered species under what circumstances. And, and your state regulatory authorities might be uncomfortable in extending your permit to apply to schools. And I think one reason that they or you might be concerned is that schools might not do a good job or follow proper protocols. I think another reason people express concern is about kind of concern of sending the wrong message, right? For example, we don't want kids thinking that it's okay to just grab animals from the wild and bring them home as pets. Um, but our experience shows that really we can address these concerns. Um, and in fact, given the proper guidance, 
schools can be really excellent turtle caretakers and in some cases um, perform better than institutions. And I'm going to share with you some of the ways that we make that happen. So what are the basic elements of a successful school-based head starting program? I'm going to go through each of these in turn. First and really most importantly, you need a sound scientific and conservation basis for your program, right? Head starting is not appropriate in all situations and even where it is appropriate, it needs to be combined with other conservation efforts that address the root causes of population decline. So before you bring your conservation program to a school, you've really got to know that you've done the background analysis and especially the field work to determine whether the pro project is merited and effective. And um, establishing scientific merit isn't just a one and done operation either, right? Your program needs to involve continuous data collection, analysis, reevaluation, and really most importantly, you need to be collecting data on the survival and growth of your head started turtles after you release them back to the wild, because that's the only way you're gonna know if your program is providing a conservation benefit to the population. So for example, at our populations, um, of the thousand plus turtles that we've had started and released, we've radio tracked more than 200 of those, some for more than five continuous years. Um, the second element that you're gonna need for a successful program is committed partners. Um, right, you need enthusiastic teachers and you need supportive regulators. Um, I have the, the project leader listed as quote the scientist here because um, as I just noted, right, we really think it's imperative that projects be primarily scientific, not educational. So for example, as a zoo, we have both scientific and educational specialists that are involved in our program, but the program is driven by the scientists to ensure that we are always staying focused on those scientific objectives. Um, so, um, what, one more partner that you're gonna need, oops, I'm sorry, um, is veterinary expertise. So if you're a zoo like us, right, you might have this in-house, but if not, you're gonna need to reach out to establish a connection with a wild animal clinic or a veterinarian that has substantial experience working with turtles. Um, it's pretty rare that we have health concerns during our turtle head starting, but it definitely does happen. So you need to have a plan in place for who you're gonna call if you have a um, turtle injury or health concern. Um, and the last thing that we believe that you need is age-appropriate educational curriculum, right? It's certainly possible to partner with schools without providing them with any associated curriculum, but we feel like the, Im the impacts of that kind of partnership are then much more dependent on the effort and knowledge of the teacher or teachers that are involved, and they might not have the desired outcomes that you're looking for. So at the very, very least, you're gonna to wanna to be providing your classrooms with a background on your conservation program and the main take home lessons that you want them to remember, such as not to move turtles or that turtles aren't good pets or whatever the issues are in your region. So let's say that you're interested in doing this, but you wanna make sure you don't like one of our texts here. Um, what are some of those common pitfalls that you wanna avoid? Um, I think the first common pitfall is um, a top down, having like a top down approach. So we see a lot of problems when you get directives that come from on high. So for example, if a school principal really likes the program and then forces teachers to participate, the program's gonna suffer, right? At best, those disinterested teachers are not gonna take full advantage of the program. They're not gonna communicate much enthusiasm to the students. Um, and at worst, right, they might do a bad job caring for your turtles and you might have health issues. Um, you also get similar problems if there's a top-down um, approach within your organizational leadership that says like we really want to do this but you know the people who are actually implementing it don't have the capacity or the interest in the program right a lot of our conservation organizations are understaffed and overburdened and um, taking on a school partnership is not a simple endeavor so you really want to make sure you have buy-in at all levels of your organization um, the second common pitfall is trying to grow too big too fast, right? You don't want to get greedy like Skittles here. Um, if this is something that you haven't done before, if you haven't worked with schools, you really want to start small, right? Maybe just working with a few schools initially, 
you really want to make sure that you have that capacity to communicate with all the teachers and visit them regularly and, and make sure that everything is going smoothly. And the third pitfall is something that I'm calling tail wagging the turtle. And um, by this, I just mean don't let your educational goals unduly influence the conservation program. So sometimes it can be easy to get wrapped up in your educational program and lose sight of your conservation objectives. And like, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but again, you always want to keep those conservation goals front and center. And, and also don't be shy about sharing those goals with your students, right? It's really, really empowering for kids to realize that they're part of a real scientific project and kids actually just love that. Um, so the last thing I want to talk about here is risk mitigation. So there are a few different aspects to risk mitigation. And the first one is welfare of the individual animals. So of course, we want to make sure that the animals that are in schools are being taken care of well. And a few things that we have found are key to this are, first of all, providing schools with a detailed care manual, right, that outlines all the protocols, expectations, supplies, techniques. Um, but we also know that just giving someone a manual doesn't mean they're going to read it. Um, so you also really want to make sure that you have training sessions for teachers and students, right? We have face-to-face -face training sessions with all of our new teachers. And we have our students all watch a video that goes over things like safe turtle handling and feeding, etc. And finally, we have regular communications with all of our teachers, right? We're visiting them on a regular basis. Um, we send them monthly newsletters, and they are also submitting to us monthly data on their turtle growth. So there's a lot of back and forth that's happening there. Now, the second aspect of risk mitigation is welfare of the wild population. Right? Again, it's a conservation program. We want to um, make sure we're helping the wild population, and we want to minimize any possibility of introducing non-native pathogens to the wild population. So to that end, we're following really strict isolation protocols and we're regularly inspecting classrooms to make sure that there are no other cold-blooded vertebrates in the classroom and that the classrooms are following those safe handling protocols. Um, we also teach our students about disease risk, right? We explain to them things like how dumping your unwanted goldfish into the local pond um, can create invasive species or make uh, native animals sick. Um, and finally, we're also, like I said, right, we're conducting a lot of that post-release monitoring and field work in the wild population to keep tabs on the wild population and make sure that things are going well. And I think the final aspect of risk mitigation is sending the right message, right? We want to teach kids that wild animals are best left in the wild. Um, and, you know, we, so we teach our students, right, that participate that they actually have a special permit from the state to be raising the turtles, and that if they didn't have a permit, they could get arrested. Um, they learn that they're part of a conservation program and that it's only because they're part of this program with scientists that are carefully monitoring the population that it's okay to bring the turtles in for head starting. We're also teaching kids that turtles don't make good pets, right? Because of how long lived they are. And so so that the best way to enjoy turtles, if they love turtles, is to enjoy them in the wild. And finally, the message that we try to hammer home in every interaction we have with students is that, and this is really core to our mission, is that we can make a difference, right? Kids are constantly being bombarded with negative environmental messages from the climate crisis, right? Mass extinction, trash in the oceans. Um, we hear from kids and also many adults who are demoralized and, uh, and feel a lot of despair about the future, right? But actually there is hope. Um, there are environmental success stories and there are ways that each one of us can make a difference and are making a difference. And so through Head Starting a Turtle, kids feel empowered. They see right firsthand how they've made a difference for their little turtle and how that little turtle is now part of a larger population and part of a community of wildlife in their town or their region. So we really hope that more organizations partner with schools and help share this message of optimism and hope and love for nature with as many kids as possible. Um, so 
what are the next steps? Um, we are currently working on publishing some of our results, both of the head starting results in the classroom and then that post release uh, monitoring information. And we're also working on a, a more in depth manual that goes through some of the topics that I've just covered, um, thinking about, um, you know, for basically like more in depth, if an organization is interested in working with schools, what are the things that they need to think about. So if that's something that is interesting to you, or you have further questions, or you just want to um, find out when that manual becomes available, definitely contact us at GWC at ZenoEngland.org. So I will take any questions that people have. It looks like some have come into the chat. So let me just check those. Okay. Um, let's see. So question number one was, how can I help with their field studies and Head Start programs? I was a member of NEHS for years and remember when Kurt started the Ruby Ventures program. Um, so I guess it sounds like the question is how can you help in our program and definitely get in touch with us if you're interested or you're local um, and want to be involved. Um, and even if you're not local and want to find out more, get in touch, right? GWC at ZenoEngland.org. Um, there's also a question here about if we're doing any subsidized predator control. We do not do any uh, subsidized predator control at our site. Um, we do have um, some predation that's happening to our released head starts, but it's not a significant factor. Um, so we don't do that. Um, let's see, someone. So there's a question here about salmonella. Um, yeah, so we, that, is, that is in our manual and we talk about safe handling practices, right? Turtles can carry salmonella. And, um, you know, so part of one of the, the, you know, the kids, are, the kids learn that they need to wash their hands before and after handling the turtles, um, that that's just good safe practice. And um, it hasn't been an issue for us. We, um, yeah, it hasn't been an issue. So that's been really great. And just kind of, so basically just, you know, kind of alleviating those fears and sharing with people, you know, what, what they can do to mitigate risk is helpful. Um, and it looks like one last question is, oh, so who's taking care of the turtles since schools haven't been in session? So of course, um, COVID has been extremely fun for us um, working with schools. And um, that was obviously a big issue in the spring when, you know, we had all these turtles in schools um, we had over 100, um, 100 turtles that were all around different schools and suddenly school was shut down. But um, thankfully, you know, we have very enthusiastic teachers, many of them who have been working with us for like since, you know, these past 10 years, um, year after year. And so most of the teachers actually were able to take their turtles home with them. Um, you know, again, following the same protocols and, and isolation rules in their homes. And they were able to continue the program and share with their students over webcams and, and live video feeds and things. And we actually did our um, turtle release field trips this past year um, over Zoom. So live turtle release field trips. Obviously, it's not as great as bringing kids out into the wetland and getting, letting them see it directly. Um, but right, we're doing the best um, with the situation that we have and we're, we're planning similar virtual programs this school year as well. Okay, so um, again, thank you everyone so much. Um, and if you um, wanna know more, then um, let, us, let us know and be in touch, gwc at xenoengland.org. Thank you.